Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akish Rafi. Today is October 13, 2023, and I'm speaking with Christopher Heaney. He's the author of Empires of the Dead, Inca Mummies, and the Peruvian Ancestors of American Anthropology, which has just come out from Oxford University Press. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm very happy to be here. I had a Pox Fellowship back in 2012, right. which took me to Philadelphia and was completely transformative for what the dissertation and then now book became. And so it's lovely to be able to come back here and share a little bit of it with you. Well, it's a wonderful book, and I'm glad we could help a little bit. Why don't we start with what is a Peruvian mummy and how does it differ from the images of Egyptian mummies with which we might be familiar? That's a wonderful question. Mummies as a term and as an idea really come to us through Europe's encounter with Egypt and the Near East in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. And so that's left a mark on Egyptology and archaeology, but also popular culture, so that when most of us think about a mummy, maybe the thing that flashes into our minds is King Tut, Tutankhamun, or maybe more realistically, Boris Karloff as the mummy in, you know, a universal horror creature feature, or more recently, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, what's lovely about that, that is actually a Peruvian mummy, even though it's kind of depicted like an Egyptian one. And I'm sure the listeners will be able to call that up in their minds, you know, a body lying supine, wrapped up, bound together, looking well-preserved, but certainly more dead than alive. Uh, the per Peruvian mummies and Andean mummies or mummified ancestors actually reflect a d very different Andean understanding of what a past ancestor was, which is not just somebody who's dead and gone, but still socially active and involved in the lives of the living. So uh, for the Incas, this meant uh, that they were seated and were carried about on litters and um, sat in their palaces. And in general, this sort of translates and is, uh, the Inca example is the product of a longer Andean culture of interring ancestors and the dead in sort of seed-like bundled positions, sometimes been likened to being wrapped up like a fetus, as if in death they were approaching how they were when they came into the world, but also in positions that suggested that, you know, they were there to be interacted with, spoken to. And when they end up in museums, which is what one of the things that my book is about, they are sitting, sometimes gazing at the visitor and viewer, uh, communicating a very different idea, not death, but life and continuity between, between these different stages. When you say they're live and active, can you say more about why these bodies were preserved and how they were used or understood, especially in the expanding empire of the Incas before the Spanish invasion of the mid-16th century? Absolutely. There is a very deep history of ancestors and remains being mummified in the Andes and in South America. The oldest artificially mummified remains in the world are from the Chinchorro people in what is today Chile or Arica on the, uh, the South American coast. And when they began mummifying um, their dead or preparing them to have a, a longer and more stable afterlife, they actually started with their children. And we can understand that as being an extension of grief and an extension of loss that sought to turn maybe the hardest thing into something that could be born and also could and this is where anthrop I'm drawing very much from anthropology and how they think of it as turning, turning kin, children, and then later on ancestors, older members of society, into things like beings like seeds that could be offered food, beverages, could be given offerings to then communicate with the environments to support society. Um, the living and their descendants. And over the, um, the next 7,000 years, sort of these different techniques of mummification, many of which relied upon Andean climates, very dry in some places, very cold in others, to turn ancestors and kin into stable members of society, at least for a little while. There isn't one long mainstream 
of, of mummification and uh, even talking about it as Andean means sort of a level of generalization that didn't happen until colonialism and the Republican period. But nonetheless, by around 1000 CE or AD, we see the development of what archaeologists sometimes talk about as the Andean cultural package of, of ancestor veneration particularly in the highlands, um, in the mountains, where ancestors are preserved in seated positions, like I mentioned before, um, but placed in open tombs or interments or palaces where they're accessible and where they can be visited and wrapped and rewrapped and asked questions of to guide society. And the Inca Empire elevated these text techniques to the level of political authority and control in almost a universal sense. This is one of the ways that we can think about them as an empire, as something comparable to imperial forms elsewhere. They took their own ancestors or their own emperors in particular, but also their wives, consorts, empresses. And after they died, preserved them in seated positions using a combination of botanicals, but also anatomical interventions, similar to what our listeners might know of how Egyptian mummies were made, to turn their emperors into essentially everlasting beings who continued to own property, continued to own their palaces, continued to own the places they had conquered in life that then supported themselves, their cult, but also the family members who continue to interpret their desires, many of whom have seemed to be women. Priestesses towards the mummies seem to have enjoyed a fair amount of political authority and control over relationships to those mummies. And it was a way that we can think of women's power in the Inca Empire. And the last thing I'll say about it is that some archaeologists go so far as to suggest that Inca imperial expansion spread some of these techniques of more permanent preservation to some of the people that they incorporated or sometimes tried to conquer. And the idea behind this theory is, I mean, it's, it's shown in, in how archaeologists and anthropologists have engaged with changes in preservation from before an imperial horizon and afterwards. And after the imperial horizon, some subject ancestors become much more firmly preserved, which they used to sort of think about, well, how did that serve the empire? Maybe the preservation of a subject's ancestor was a way of essentially signing a contract showing this is the person that local noble that was conquered or incorporated and our speaking here is the incas our respect for this local venerated ancestor is what binds you reciprocally to the empire that you are responsible for delivering tribute and labor to the empire because of this relationship these hierarchies of preserved beings I lied. There is one other thing to say about it, which is that another way we can think about the Incas as an empire is through uh, sometimes the collection of their own subjects' uh, venerated ancestors. That if a subject's ancestor, a preserved ancestor, was sacred enough or spiritually efficacious enough, sometimes the empire would adopt it and take it to Cusco, the imperial center, to join the house of the Inca emperor who subjugated or incorporated them and uh, command them in, in a way that one archaeologist, George Lau, has suggested is similar to the imperial museum practices of uh, European empires, and which is an aspect I think is particularly important for thinking about what happens after the Spaniards arrive. So let's talk about that. Once the Spaniards arrive and the empire obviously changes and there's the indigenous communities, but also the Spanish communities and the Creole as well. So how did the understanding and use of these artifacts change after the arrival of the Spaniards? When the Spanish arrived, one of the first things they noticed was this practice of treating with and attending to and to the extent of venerating the ancestral dead, both among the Incas and then in many of the um, temples and sacred spaces that they looted on the way to Cusco. At first, they focused more on the fact of these Andean ancestors' wealth. In the case of the Inca emperor, that he and, and the empress were covered with gold and silver that could be stolen. But they also attended to how well-preserved they were. And this is where you know, one of the chief interventions of my book, I hope, for the first third is to show how uh, this invasion and attempted conquest by the Spanish was as scientific as it was spiritual when it came to the Inca and Andean dead. They wanted to know exactly how, in the word that the Spanish used, how the Incas were, quote, embalmed, 
in describing them as embalmed, they were attaching it to this um, old world tradition of treating the remains of kings and queens and uh, wealthy people as well in the early modern period, but also in antiquity with botanicals, materia medica, that extended the life of a body. And the Spaniards were incredibly impressed by the Inca remains when they saw them. They interpret them as, as whole and preserved as if they had just died the day before. From the 1530s, 1537, 1538, the Spanish crown is already asking for samples of, quote, balsam of Peru, which was the material that the Spaniards associated with Inca embalming practices. And this was to monetize them, to turn that practice into something that could be sold. But it was also a way of trying to desacralize Andean empire and take it from a realm of the cosmic where Andean ancestors outlived their sort of expiration of breath, could command the, the affections of their, of their subjects and their kin, and shift into the realm of the scientific, saying it's not because that they were spiritually powerful. It's because they were treated by an Andean or Inca facility with anatomy, with botanicals. And so I think this is when the arrival of the word mummy to the Andes helps us think about power and control and how scientific terms really try to simplify things and sometimes do violence to an original understanding of the dead. Because to, to refer to the Andean and Inca ancestors as dead or mummies really tries to box them in a realm of anatomy, of science, of comparison uh, with Egypt when Andean peoples and the Incas had their own many different words for who these beings were. For the Incas, they were Iyapa, which connected them to the lightning bringing gods. They were hardened, they were shining. For one group of their subjects in the area of Cajatambo, they called them Malkis, which likened the Andean dead to roots or fruit or cuttings that could be replanted, a more vegetal uh, metaphor. But the labeling of the Incas and Andean dead as mummies particularly after the 16th, 17th century invasion, means that in the 18th century, Europeans who were reading about Peru, and they were reading a lot about Peru from the 16th century, it was one of the chief drivers of what we would call today ethnological or ethnographic scholarship in the 16th and 17th century. Outsiders reading about them came to expect that if you wanted to look at mummies in the New World, in the Americas, that Peru was the place to look. And that the Incas, at least according to the Inca chronicler Garcilaso de la Vega, that the Incas had perhaps better preserved mummies than anybody else on earth, um, which became mm -hmm. a point of pride for Peruvian Creoles and uh, patriot, as in the word that Jorge Camisar Esquera uses, patriot epistemologists, uh, people who are imagining Peruvian independence in the late 18th, early 19th century. This becomes something they can grab onto as part of a pre-colonial national tradition that Peru is the hearth of anatomy and also scientific sovereignty in the Americas, which leads to, and this is a story in and of itself, but I'll give a space for questions after this, to the, uh, the South American patriot Jose de San Martin, after declaring Peruvian independence in 1821, he announces that independence to England and to Great Britain by sending King George IV of England, a so-called Inca mummy, to go in the British Museum, which was sort of a statement of um, scientific purpose, as well as sovereignty that connected the new Peruvian nation to this long tradition of Andean science and Inca identity, though not necessarily, or actually not at all, living Inca or in Andean people. What about indigenous communities? Did the production of mummies continue under Spanish rule? And how did the understanding or use of mummies by indigenous peoples change after the Spanish arrived? Andean people continue to preserve and inter their dead as they had before the Spanish arrival, it seems through the early 17th century. This was partly because the evangelization in the Andes for at least the first 30 or so years really sought to find points of contact between old and or like European Christian understandings of death and the afterlife and Andean ones. And so in the 1890s, for example, the archaeologist Adolf Bandelier found a mummified body bundled up 
with a copy of a papal bull close to its chest, uh, showing that in this period of transition, communities were continuing to inter their dead according to original practices, but in ways that reflected new Andean Christian identities. The hard and difficult line is that from the 1570s on, Spanish colonial and religious authorities tried to crack down as part of the counter-reformation and as a method of eliminating religious and political competition from the Incas and old Andean leaders. In the seven, early 17th century in particular, Spanish religious orders conduct extirpations of idolatry in the Andean highlands, which forces uh, many communities who had converted to Christianity, were worshiping in churches on the day of worship, but the day before were still visiting some of the ancestors and still moving occasionally uh, individuals who died from the church into the countryside. And in the 17th century, we see a number of literal bonfires of these ancestors that sought to show to some Andean people that they were no longer spiritually active, that they were in fact in hell because they had died before receiving Christianity. Nevertheless, Andean peoples continued to, and also Peruvian ones, people who had mixed heritages or heritages that combined Andean ancestors, but also European ones. And as well as African ones, they continued to develop new ways of relating to this dead. Perhaps they were no longer referred to as a specific ancestor identified as a personal ancestor, but they were described as the original owners of the land. The ethnologist and ethnohistorian Frank Salomon in the area that he worked and works in Huarochiri, there these ancestors, these mummified bodies and sometimes skulls still encountered in the countryside are referred to as abuelitos or the little or beautiful grandparents, suggesting a, a relationship of descent, but that's also nonetheless somewhat anonymous. It's no longer a named individual, but a, a distant, more distant affine. Where it um, gets even more challenging for us, particularly coming from scholarship in the United States, is understanding how Andean descendants and members of Andean communities took another tack in relating to these ancestors, which was to occasionally participate in their looting alongside Spaniards and other Creole members of society. And they may have done so for a number of reasons. They might have been doing it in order to dig up the remains and inter them somewhere else so that they wouldn't be damaged. We also know that they were doing it to loot the wealthy uh, former lords. And here it's we can think of it sort of as a, a leveling. An ancestor isn't everyone's ancestor. And if it's the ancestor of a local noble, we can understand why a community might have decided to take advantage of that wealth. And then there's still more creolized or, or hybrid ways of interacting with the dead, which saw them as continuing to possess religious and political power. That interacting with these original owners of the land was a way of gaining purchase within colonial society. And so going into the 19th and 20th century, there is a broad universe of interactions with the dead. In some places in Peru and the Andes, Andean peoples are working with outsiders to open interments, in, particularly in the Andes itself. In the highlands, uh, there are more reciprocal relationships that weren't connected to looting or exposure. But you know, if a person ran across a mummified ancestor or kin as they were walking through the mountains, they would leave them an offering. And in still other places, it was a combination of those things where, you know, if you came across a tomb in the countryside, it might be appropriate to or possible to, to remove a pot or a ceramic. But in return, you don't disturb um, the remains and you leave them an offering. And so it's an incredibly complicated set of relationships that, that to this day uh, shape the practice of what we'd call archaeology. But you know, one of the things my book tries to show is that archaeology is as much an extension of colonial looting and extirpation as it is a science that certainly didn't arrive in the 19th century. I think it arrives and takes shape in the 18th century. You mentioned San Martin sending mummies to Britain. And of course, a large number of mummies were dug up and collected by foreigners. But you also tell us in your book about Peruvians collecting these remains and sending mummies and especially skulls abroad. Can you say more about why Peruvians did that? Yeah, thank you. This is one of 
the more challenging points that took me a while to sort of understand and wrap my head around because one of the narratives that I think we have for from the realm of the history of archaeology and the history of museums and cultural patrimony is that in these contexts that we might see as like post-colonial or as still colonial, um, the assumption is that it's the exterior market or imperialism that is pulling archaeological remains or indigenous remains. And this is true in many settings, particularly in talking about the United States and how settler colonialism and slavery uh, shaped the collection of ancestors and kin in the Americas and in museums. But the side of it from Peru is that with San Martin, uh, there is also a precedent for electing to represent the nation, to represent science, to represent also Peruvian history and indigenous history via the dead, that it wasn't necessarily as racialized objects, but as representatives of a longer history that had been interrupted by colonialism. And this flies in the face of some narratives that we have about archaeology and cultural patrimony in museums in 19th century Latin America, where particularly in Peru, where sometimes the narrative can be there was a failure to protect, that this was a period of extraordinary looting. And it certainly was. This is a moment where, particularly on the coast, the influx of outsiders, but also Peru's reconnection to the international economy means that there's new opportunities to loot and new incentives for doing so, particularly if you can sell it to a foreigner or abroad. But there was also a early 19th century and mid 19th century scientific liberalism that seems to be embodied by many of Peru's early scientific actors, where the goal of a museum isn't just to be a showcase for the nation. It is to be increasingly universal that what Peru's National Museum originally is supposed to include, and historian of science Stephanie Ganger's work is excellent on this, it's meant to have objects from all over the world, from Egypt, from Italy, from Great Britain. And one of the ways that the Peruvian state and its technocrats seek to achieve that is by encouraging trades. Peru has the scientific resource of mummified ancestors. And if that's a slightly horrific sentence, for you it is for me too. But nonetheless, it's one that um, helps us understand the historical difference of this moment that Mariano Eduardo de Rivero, the, the first director of Peru's National Museum and its founder, was assisting foreigners in collecting samples of guano and doing other expeditions to collect other scientific resources in promoting mining in Peru. The idea being that what Peru needed was more interaction with outsiders and economies, and that there was a value in uh, making sure that ruins weren't looted, but that there was a sociability and sort of peer equality that came from sending a, muse a mummy from Peru's National Museum to, for example, the Museum of Ethnography in Vienna, and that hopefully the Museum of Ethnography in Vienna will send something back and thereby enrich Peru's National Museum. By the late 19th and early 20th century, though, it's a slightly different value. And by that point, Peruvian scholars and the state are becoming aware that you know, the looting has been massive and that there are real reasons to sort of extend laws that make it harder for foreigners to export remains and artifacts. But nonetheless, you still have some Peruvian um, intellectuals and scholars exporting now less mummies, but now more skulls to engage with 19th century and early 20th century Americanist anthropology. Sometimes in a way that sort of fueled some of the, the racialist hierarchies that that anthropology trucked in, but also occasionally to challenge them. The last chapters of my book focus on trepanation, which is a surgery that seeks to relieve pressure on the brain by elevating or removing a piece of skull. And we know of its global antiquity because in the mid 19th century, a series of Peruvian antiquarians proved it, showed that before the Spaniards arrived, Inca and Andean people were practicing trepanation. In fact, um, it turned out by the late 19th century, they could argue that the Incas were more successful at trepanation than any other person worldwide, including Europeans through the late 19th century. And then in the, uh, the last chapters of my book focus on a Andean archaeologist named 
Julio Cesar Teo, who was probably Harvard's first student from Peru, but he started his career as a surgeon and realized that his own father had provided a trepan skull to a Lima a doctor and anthropologist who then sent it on to Chicago and then Washington, D.C. And he realized that there was a larger debate happening over Andean society through these trepan skulls that he wanted to be involved with that for him was a way of showing that people like himself, a person of Andean scent, had a history of science and medicine that in some cases was superior to that of Europe. And so he brought his massive collection of trepanned Andean skulls to the United States, ultimately selling them to a Harvard alum, which is why they're in the Peabody Museum today. And so that story also challenges our understanding of what is exactly happening in the export of remains, that of course it fits into this longer history of race and extirpation that made non-Christian tombs in the Andes more vulnerable to looting and appropriation. But you also see Peruvians and people of Andean descent trying to turn these original violences into something that could heal and also carve a place for them in the larger landscape of the history of science and museums in the Americas and world. So as a result of these processes you're describing, enormous numbers of Andean remains, mummies, and skulls were collected by institutions in the United States and Europe. How did collecting, studying, displaying these artifacts transform anthropology and archaeology? This is maybe one of the more polemical points of, of my book, and I totally am embracing that. In connecting Inca mummies to Peruvian ancestors of American anthropology, the book is making a larger argument that these earlier colonial and republican engagements between outsiders and Andean peoples over the dead was foundational to a particular branch of Americanist anthropology. The Americanist anthropology that focused um, so much on human remains in the 19th century and the early 20th century, and whose legacy is still with us in the museums that they built. My book shows that between 1820 and 1920, anthropologists in the United States collected more remains, human remains, ancestors, kin, mummies, skulls, from Peru and the Andes than any other single population. This means that the largest single population at the Smithsonian uh, today are so-called ancient Peruvians or Andean peoples from Peru and some from Bolivia. This is also true of the collection of Samuel George Morton, the infamous craniologist who lived and died there in, uh, there in Philadelphia, who had more ancient Peruvians than any other single group in his collection. It's true of Harvard, who by their fifth or sixth year, two-thirds of their collection was from Peru. It's true of American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum, and the Museum of Us in San Diego, formerly the Museum of Man. And rather than take those points as incidental or just simply, you know, a, a numbers game, counting, measurement, I argue that that's, that's actually tells us a story about the history of science and the history of anthropology that says that approaching it exclusively from a U.S. perspective isn't going to help us understand how fields get built. And the crucial hinge for that, and this is what I researched there in Philadelphia, is Samuel George Morton. Before he started collecting, there were Andean and ancient Peruvian remains in Philadelphia. In fact, they were at least two times more numerous than indigenous North American remains in the collection of the University of Pennsylvania by 1830, which was partly a story of Peruvian independence and foreign collectors going to Peru to collect skulls. But what Morton did through his landmark book, Crania Americana, was to show how large series of a particular population could be used to mount larger scientific arguments. Before him, collections largely focused on types, individual skulls that could be generalized from and used to say this is a Mongolian type or this is insert fictional race here that sort of has us thinking of, you know, Blumenbach and his five skulls um, and five types of humanity that racialize large groups of people into in particular boxes. After Morton, single types become insufficient for the type of arguments that he sets people onto. He um, engages in the work of collecting large numbers of Peruvian ancestors and filling their skulls with bird seed and shot 
to measure their internal capacity and then averaging those numbers together. This book, Crania Americana, that spends more of its pages on the ancient Peruvians than any other single group, has more images of the ancient Peruvians than any other single group, becomes what everyone is at least responding to. Not everyone agrees with Morton, and in particular, there are European craniologists that are already saying what we know from bioanthropology to be true now, which is that there's more variation within groups than between them, that trying to create an average is extraordinarily reductive in, and also, as we know now, racist and white supremacist, in that it sort of assigns particular values to larger cranial capacities that we know don't correspond to actual culture or civilization. But that for Morton was a way of talking about the past and making connection between, in the case of Crania Americana, between indigenous Native Americans living in the United States today to ancient Peruvians, saying that they are all one group and that group's skull size tends to be smaller. And if judged by the ancient Peruvians and Incas, they're also doomed to extinction. And I think this is, you know, this is one of the legacies that's at the heart of the practice of the collection of human remains in the Americas that accelerates through the ancient Andean dead. And even if people are contesting Morton, they're still presuming in the 19th century, white scholars in particular are still presuming that the way you do it is by building larger and larger collections of human remains, which is how you get to the, the Smithsonian having so many remains from all over the world, but particularly from Peru, so many that in 1965, when the, the Smithsonian opens its very first hall of physical anthropology in the National Museum of Natural History, the first thing a viewer sees is the so-called skull wall. 160 ancient Peruvian skulls arranged in the shape of a mushroom cloud to tell the story of all humanity's growth. The stories that anthropology and archaeology want to tell themselves about their birth as a science or transformation as a science tend to focus on the culturalist interventions of Franz Boas and how it has become an anti-racist, an anti-racializing science, which is an extremely important part of the story. But the physical infrastructures that this earlier era set up are still with us, as seen in by protests by groups like Finding Ceremony there in Philadelphia regarding the Morton collection and the attempt to retrieve the ancestors and kin of black Philadelphians, to the Smithsonian, where laws related to NAGPRA and NAGPRA for other museums have affected the return of many ancestors and kin, but not others. NAGPRA and museum debates in the United States largely have focused in national terms on Native North Americans, black Americans, leaving out the communities that were collected from further abroad. And some people have called for a acts like the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, which is NAGPRA um, passed by the U.S. Congress in the early 1990s for other communities, African-American communities, for example, as well. These moves are important and they're good, but it still leaves to the side the single largest population in many collections, which is ancient Peruvian and Andean remains, which it's almost fitting. They're, they become like an alpha and omega of the story of how anthropology and archaeology brought ancestors and kins from interments to museums throughout the Americas. Chris, you have so many interesting stories and insights that you found in the United States and in Peru in your book. Can you tell us a little bit about your research process and the sources that you found about Andean remains and the way that they were moved or used? This is a question I've been thinking a lot about since I've started talking about this book with students and visiting classes. And one of the things that they have noticed, and this was actually in a, a wonderful class of um, graduate students taught by our colleague and friend, Rosanna Dent. And one of the things they noticed was just how many of my archives were from the United States, Great Britain, Spain, not Peru. I visited at least 26 archives and museums to research this, and the majority of them are outside of Peru. For the last several chapters, you know, those fewer archives from Peru are crucial for late 19th, early 20th century archaeology and museum building. The story of the, the Peruvian National Museum, for example, couldn't have been written without Peruvian sources. But the sheer number of materials from um, U.S. institutions, you know, it can mark a few things. One of them is not flattering towards me. It might reflect, you know, sort of the positionality of my research 
the imperial nature of studying a process of what is sometimes imperial collecting that, you know, if I'm focusing on the U.S. archives, that maybe I'm just reflecting the U.S. story. And I think, you know, I've, I've been conscious of that and tried to correct for that. I also think that it does show, you know, a real phenomenon, which is just how much of the history of science and museums and um, indigenous history in Peru is in archives elsewhere other than Peru, which has had a real effect on, I think, the history of science and anthropology in Peru that, you know, that the 19th century is sometimes treated. And this, I think, is true of other places as well in, in the global south as a period of foreign colonial actors doing science. Uh, because there are less national archives to tell that story. These archives, though, I like to flip the interpretation there, show that how many of these archives outside of Peru are just filled with references of these foreign collectors working with or relying upon the labor of Peruvian or Latin American scientists, doctors, collectors, um, museum builders, whose own institutions maybe didn't survive the 19th century, but were transformative for the study and collection of the Andean dead and ancestors abroad. One of the saddest examples that I can think of is the story of Manuel Muniz, the Surgeon General who sent the Trepan skull that went to Chicago and Washington, D.C., that inspired Julio Cesar Teo. And in the early 1890s, uh, he had what seems to have been the largest collection of pre-Hispanic or pre-European remains in the hemisphere, about a thousand skulls, ancestors of people from Peru. He likely also had an archive that would have been tremendous and incredible for us to use. His collection was being used by scientific societies in Lima in the late 1890s to have very active debates over whether race is present in skulls and how. But his whole collection got burned in the early 1890s during a civil war in the capital that made that collection invisible, or at least less visible over the long term. The, the 19... Trepan skulls that he sent to Washington, D.C. He ultimately hoped that those skulls would return to Peru. But once the rest of his collection was burnt, he decided to make a trade to the Bureau of American Ethnology and the Smithsonian to get books to rebuild his library and start anew again, which to me is a, a story about sources and scholarly communication and collaboration that can be recovered by engaging with you know, the archives of what seems like um, the empire and sort of realizing that it becomes that way because of the stories we tell about it and it tells about itself. One of the things that I hope the book can do is to show how American institutions have been entangled with Peruvian scholars and museums and archives since the earliest era of Americanist anthropology and that there's an obligation that comes from that one that fits into the repatriation of or restitution of archives, archival materials that would allow Peruvian scholars to also tell a story or a different story than the one that I maybe a very narrowly or too broadly selected, but also that connects to the story of those Andean ancestors themselves and where they might end up. So now, some 500 years after the start of the story as you tell it, is the story of the Andean dead finally over? Not at all. And it's been going on for over seven millennia in some cases and will go on even longer. The Peruvian writer Gabriela Wiener writes about visiting one of the museums in Paris that has the Andean dead inside of it, the Ethnography Museum. And she writes about coming across an empty museum case that has a single label saying mummy of an infant child from Peru and the impulses that take over her in that moment. She imagines if that child were there breaking open the glass and running with it out into the street. And I think it's important to understand and to emphasize that these beings and individuals that have been collected for scientific reasons, but also for colonial and extirpatory reasons, for a very long time still have the ability and effect upon the living. They have relationships to Andean and Peruvian descendants who are discovering how many of their ancestors or kin were exported abroad. Sometimes it can be framed as you know provoking different kinds of nationalism. Peru was not an entity that existed formally until 
the 16th century uh, Spanish started referring to the Inca Empire as Peru. But it nonetheless captures something, which is a relationship to individuals that sometimes are discriminated against as indigenous or Andean, but that more and more Peruvians are identifying with after you know, a period of extraordinarily marginalization and exclusion of Andean people, a period that continues, but that I, I see it in Peru in, in the writings of Peruvian scholars and writers. I'm thinking in particular of the essays of Marco Aviles, who writes about Cholevad and the reclamation of an indigenous and Andean identity within Peru cities. There is an impulse to understand these ancestors as not just objects and as, or as scientific things that belong in museums, but as kin. That I think is affecting how museums are being built and used in Peru. It certainly means that, you know, local communities sometimes build their own museums to contain and display ancestors or kin or sometimes more complicated names for for pre-Hispanic remains in the countryside. It shapes questions of how in the United States we might think about like what museums are. The Peruvian government historically hasn't taken an interest um, in the restitution of human remains and ancestors in a general sense from abroad. Um, in fact, they have sometimes promoted the state and its science by sending them abroad, as in the example of San Martin, but still happening in the 1990s with the export of Juanita, the so-called ice maiden. This means that a n- number of institutions in the United States, in- while they engage in questions of how did they come to c- have so many ancestors and kin from other people in places are going to be wondering what to do about the Andean ancestors that they have. Is it something that the Peruvian state would take an interest in? Or is it something that is an opportunity for these museums to engage with communities in the Andes, not just the state, but some of the specific places that these mummies and ancestors came from? It's also an opportunity to engage with Peruvian Americans and to have that stake be recognized in how the story of science, but also, as in the case of trepanation, healing and anti-racism in the history of anthropology, how all that could be represented in American museums and institutions. And this is true of, I think, most any ancestor or individual that is turned into one that, you know, their lives continue after they stop breathing. And... Um, they continue to have spiritual meaning, but is especially true for these ancestors and kin and dead from the Andes, that it's you know short of an entire repopulation of the countryside, the return of all of these individuals and remains where they're originally found, which may or may not be practical. Practical, it's not for me to say. Short of that, I think we have to, you know, to use the words of Donna Haraway here, stay with the trouble that this is a place where the history of science and the history of museums benefits a lot from saying, you know, it's rushing to a solution isn't maybe the right choice here. The point is to listen and to listen to all the different ways that this literal dead that U.S. institutions has gathered up in the name of science, how it makes them responsible to the living as well, to other countries, other histories of ancestry of the sacred and science, and waiting to be asked to do something more. Well, thank you, Chris, for making this history a living story for us and for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Thank you so much, Babak. Christopher Heaney's book, Empires of the Dead, Inca Mummies and the Peruvian Ancestors of American Anthropology from Oxford University Press is available now from wherever you get your books. You can find more resources for exploring this topic as well as others at www.chstm.org. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine.